Um, talking about humble experiences, Larry was uh, instrumental in uh, God providing opportunities for me to be humble when I came to the States. You know, in, in, in my country, we speak Spanish, Guatemala, so I, 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 uh, I always get flashbacks when I have to communicate in English, and I remember this one junior high camp in particular, when Larry was a youth pastor, they invited me to come and speak to the group of junior hires, and I'm trying to tell them to put the full armor of God and it was going to be my last statement about God. And I said, God wants you to be a wiener for God. <laughs> and the junior hires are like, God wants me to be a wiener for him? That's worse than being a loser, you know. <laughs> be a wiener for God. <laughs> so uh, amazingly enough, in spite of us Latinos, God is using Latinos. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? The power of the kingdom now is in spite of you and me, God is doing some amazing things. Please come with me to El Salvador, 1989, the last offensive of the terrorist. Around 3 in the morning on Sunday, we heard... About 600 terrorists came down from the mountains and they started attacking the whole country. We were there with about 13 young people from Guatemala doing missions and we were stuck in a city called San Miguel. The terrorists will come into the houses and take everybody kidnapped. So then the army couldn't come and save them because they were right there in the houses. So the army started bombing all over the place. They were shooting all over the place and in the middle of war, our team got separated. And one of the key factors was to stay together, but war separated us. So now we are all over the place, scattered in San Miguel, terrorists all over the place, the army all over the place, helicopters, bombs, and bullets all over the place. And my responsibility as a youth pastor was to keep my team together. There were three kids that were missing that we couldn't find them the first day, the second day, the third day. And it wasn't until the third day that Julio, the youth pastor from El Salvador, our host pastor, came to me and he said, Jeffrey, I know where they are. I said, where are they? He said, they're in the middle, really close to downtown San Miguel. And downtown San Miguel was in a situation that was very complicated. Why? Because the army was on one side of the park. The central park was there. The houses where our kids were and the terrorists were on the other side on their trenches waiting to shoot the army and the army was waiting for the terrorists to shoot at them. And Julio explained to me that when the bombs started to fall, they divided the team and that team was right there in the middle of the army and in the middle of the terrorist fire. And he said, Jeffrey, hold my hands, we're going to pray. Close your eyes, bow your head. And he held my hands and he started praying, Father, I pray because of the power of the kingdom that you will make us invisible. And I opened my eye. <laughs> and that's where I learned to pray with my eyes open. I'm looking at this guy and say, God, when we go over the terrorist trenches, I pray that they will not see us and I pray that the army will not see us or ask us any questions because nobody was supposed to get in there. It was dangerous, probably as dangerous as the place where you serve. And he said, are you ready? I said, yes, no, <laughs> but let's go. So he started going ahead of me and I'm doing this number, you know? And he turned to me and he said, well, you pray, you believe it and you act upon it. And I thought to myself, wait a second, we pray for us to be invisible, not to be noiseless. <laughs> so I'm still gonna go like this, man. I just, my faith was not there, but the power of the kingdom now was there. And we got close to where the terrorists were right in their trenches with their AK-47s waiting for the army, and we did this thing. We went right over them, and we walked to the house, we knock into the door, they opened the door, and Julio said, we're gonna pray with those three kids there. He said, God, you made us both invisible, now we pray that all of us will be invisible. <laughs> Make a long story short, we went out the back way. 
where the army was waiting with their weapons to shoot and we walk right through them and we were together again as a team because the parable of the yeast tells me that the power of the kingdom it's invisible oh yeah so you don't see God you don't feel God you don't see him in front of you you don't see him behind you but there's good news about the power of the kingdom now the power is invisible you might not see the fruit of your work right now you might not see it tomorrow but the power of the kingdom is there because you are there how many of you seriously I want to be one I want you to be honest with me how many of you feel the presence of God here today well I don't I don't I don't feel the presence of God here I don't feel God here but who cares because it's about invisibility it's not about me feeling God praise God that my feelings do not determine the reality of the power of God good thing that the kingdom now is based on his character his power his nature and it acts in spite of me in the middle of war in the middle of bullets in the middle of where you are the invisibility of the action of the east is there it's acting even though we don't see it el chaco argentina is a very interesting location a lot of demon activity there I was in Argentina a couple months ago and after my conference this man wanted to talk to me and he said I need you to go and talk to my sister I said well I would love to go talk to your sister she's demon possessed and she has violent demons and the last time somebody tried to come to her the demon said that whoever comes back she's gonna kill him would you come and talk to my sister So I said, sure, I'll go, but not alone. I'm going to go and talk to the other speaker to come with me. So I talked to him, and he said, well, let's go. We prayed. We went to the house. We knocked on the door. Before we got there, we could already sense it. We could already sense the demon oppression. She wouldn't open the door. So the other pastor from Argentina said, in the name of Christ, I order you to open that door. And she opened the door. And I know this sounds weird, but it's true. Right there in the middle of the house, when we came in, there was a couch. And as we came in, I could sense the demons doing this number. Going against the walls. They were powerless because the kingdom was there even though it was invisible because the power of the kingdom is not about what you can see it's about the truth that God has spoken about you and about his kingdom so can we go in confidence into our neighborhoods of course why does it sound weird for me to say that demons were scared for some of us might because we have learned in this culture to believe that what you can see is really what God is doing I hope that's not the reality of what you think kingdom is because what I see in this parable and Elise is gonna help us see is that the yeast works in just incredible ways and she's gonna help us as she breaks down the theological framework of this beautiful passage to help us realize that the power of the kingdom is now right there where you are in your neighborhood but it's acting in an invisible way why don't you open your Bibles and get ready at least it's gonna help us understand this from the text Amen. and so he told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in a field. 
Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. And he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. It was a part of the third installment of Jesus' trilogy on spiritual growth and the power of the kingdom. In episode one, Jesus had begun with the seeds that fell on the path, some on rocky places, thorns, and some finally on good soil. There was a harvest that was promised, 30, 60, and even 100 times greater. There was abundance, provision, plenty, profusion, episode one. In episode two, Jesus had continued with an exposition on good seed that had been infiltrated in the night with weeds by an enemy. The harvesters were told not to worry about the work or the influence or interference of the evil one. Instead, just focus on growing up, on becoming, on connecting, on creating and serving. The promise was that at the harvest time, at the appropriate moment, there would be a reckoning or a separation. The bad seed would be burned and the wheat would be brought into the barn. There would be justice and vindication. And then Jesus begins a third time. His prologue was the same. The kingdom of heaven is like... Now we would know that this is a normal formula that was used by rabbis and teachers and commentaries of the Targum when they talked about the reign or the rule that is the kingdom of God. It was a common practice for the teacher to not utter the very name of God because God's name was too holy just to loosely say. And so because he would honor the name of God, he wouldn't say the kingdom of God. He would simply substitute another word like heaven, the kingdom of heaven. This vagueness was used to protect them from the wrath of the Roman Empire empire that they would not celebrate the establishment of any earthly kingdom. It was an ancient code of sorts. It was not like the African slaves that hid their plans to rebel or to use the underground railroad during slavery times. They were seeing the so-called spiritual swing low sweet chariot coming forth to carry me home. Go down Moses. They were not looking to the future as much as they were prophesying to their present. Oppressed people will find a way to find freedom, to dream, allow, and again, thy kingdom come. The kingdom of heaven is like. So the hearers of this parable would know what to expect. A short story with a commentary and then a life application. They were accustomed to this maxim, this moral, this model for living. That's how Jesus' stories had worked thus far. It's like when we hear the words, once upon a time, we know we're being invited into a fairy tale. Or when we hear in a galaxy far, far away, we get our lightsabers and look for Master Yoda. Are you with me? Or when somebody says, our Father who art in heaven, we like, we chime in. Hollywood be thy name. The kingdom of heaven is like. It was a familiar refrain. When you hear that language, you can relax and enjoy because you know what's about to happen. We're going to get to the happily ever after, the all man and the end. But in this parable, Jesus doesn't follow instructions. He simply tells a story. There is no character development. There is no chronological description. He does not even explain the parable like he did the other two. He does not even take a pause or a breath or a break. The images almost run together. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Oh, yes, yeah, like yeast. It's a double parallel. It's a similar story with a related revelation. So why now the complexity? Why change it up? Is this some sort of special revelation? Is this significant? Is it even a parable at all? Will there be a sequel? What does it tell us about the kingdom and her power? I am convinced and I believe that Jesus understood that in any ministry setting uh, that there are at least four kinds of people listening. First, there's the crowd of people. These are the people who are on the outskirts, on the perimeter. Those are folks who are alive and arrive on for the ride. Uh, the miracle of the free Doritos and the red Kool-Aid. Are you with me? That's the crowd. They come because you're going to have brownies or something to eat. They love stuff. They do love chubby bunnies. Amen. One of my favorite games. They'll even deal with catch the wind. They live for the Jello Olympics where you put your toes in Jello and get the marbles out. Are you with me? This is the crowd. They come because they can get something. 
And then there's the folks in the ministry who are the curious folks. These are people who come to put into perspective what they think they know like the rich young ruler or Nicodemus, they come because they need to hear something. They long for hope. They heard about God and want to make sure it's real. They may attend youth group regularly. They may even bring their version of the message remix just in case. Amen. Then there's this third group called the come and seers. These are the people in the ministry who want to come a little bit closer, who want to go a little bit further, like the blind man who wanted to see or the woman who had an issue of blood. They might even come to the leaders retreat or midweek Bible study, even if there's no video, PowerPoint, media shout, or snacks. They come to understand. And then there's the last group, the committed. These are the people who glimpse the power and the glory and the purpose and the plan of God. They will leave houses and land, mother and father, sister and brother, fame and fortune, to usher in the very preeminence of the power of God now. And so I believe that Jesus shaped this parable because he wanted to talk to each of those four kinds of people. See, the kingdom of God has the power to call us from the outer perimeter of the crowd to the intimacy of the committed. The thing about a parable, it has multiple levels of meaning. So here we go. The people who were in the crowd and heard the parable, they probably would have stopped after the reference to the mustard seed and the yeast. And that's okay. Everybody has to start somewhere. They would have made the connection that the kingdom of God is the rule of God, it's the reign of God. They would have understood that it's consistent for a tree to grow out of a seed. They understood that small things can yield big results. The lessons that the crowd heard when Jesus told the parable were this. Don't forsake or look down on the day of small things and new beginnings. They understood that the law of seed and harvest always works. If you plant, you will reap. And if you plant, you will reap more than you planted. They would know that just as governments pledge to protect its citizens, when you talk about the kingdom or the kingdom of God, it suggests that God Almighty has the power to protect those who call themselves citizens of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like she who dwelt in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. They would have heard that the presence and the power of the kingdom has been some connection to human effort. You have to put something in the ground to expect a harvest. Teresa of Avila would say it this way, Christ has no body now on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. The crowd heard Jesus say this, yeast will always increase. The kingdom of God is not only invisible, the kingdom of God is on the increase. Now, the people who were the curious folks, when they heard the parable, they was happy. Okay, God, this is great. Seeds become trees and protection. This is great. I'm in for the long haul of the curious. But the curious folks in the ministry, they always have additional questions. They always do. And so they said, well, now, you know, Jesus, I like this whole the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like this. But I know from modern English translation that indeed your parable is not really a parable. Are you with me? If you look at the text, you understand that the kingdom of heaven is like is more like a similar or a metaphor than a parable. In a simile, you take an object that you know to describe an object that you don't know. A simile is about description and not definition. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. A simile is like when you ask your fifth graders in junior high, how do you describe God? And they say, oh, they don't know anything about the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the omnipotent one, but they do know God is like Coke. He's the real thing. Amen. Oh, they know God is like scotch tape. You can't see him, but you know he's there. God is like all state. You are in good hands if you have them. And God is like American Express. Don't leave home without him. Similarly, God is like. The kingdom of God is like. And so while the crowd was okay with just the whole yeast stuff, the curious were asking questions. How does this kingdom power actually work? What is its source? And so they were a somewhat agrarian group, so they would easily have known that plants grow because it receives nutrients, water, and light. They probably understood the whole mechanism of power that is connected to photosynthesis. They would probably know that in order for a tree to grow from a seed, it has to have water, 
light, and nutrients. They probably would know that in order for a tree to grow, it has to take in the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, internalize it, and expel oxygen so that something else can grow. Are you with me? They probably understood the best thing, that if you want the kingdom to come, you have to be in relationship with the sun. Are you there? Uh, they understand that if you put a tree in sunlight, it will grow. Likewise, the kingdom of God is powered by our relationship, not to the S-U-N, but our relationship to the S-O-N. Amen? It's not solar energy, but it's Savior energy. That's what the power of the kingdom is like. The songwriter says it this way, this is the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. But yeast is different than a mustard seed. You don't need direct sunlight. However, a similar biochemical process is happening. See, bread rises because of teeny bubbles of carbon dioxide that are released. Does that sound familiar? Yeast and seeds have something in common. The kingdom is strategic. The kingdom is intentional. The woman in the text used a large amount of flour. She used so much flour, it couldn't have really been just about her. Those who want to harness, experience, realize, usher in the very power of the kingdom of God have to prepare for other folks outside the people that are just like them. In fact, many of us, most of us, some of us in ministry, we have what some of us call the holy huddle, amen? The 10 or 15 kids that we just love like they our own, amen? We like to put them in our car. We put them all in our four es escape, even though there's only four seats we get 10 kids in, amen? These are the ones we're going to shepherd and we're going to love. And it's a little harder to love the kids that are hard to love or a little bit unlovable. But the kingdom of God is intentional about including everybody because she had 22 liters of flour, the kingdom of God draws power because it includes, or we would exclude the kingdom of God would draw the circle bigger. Yeast, you have to knead it, you have to let it rise, you have to shape it, you have to test it, you have to bake it, and then you let it cool. The kingdom of God comes in a process. So the curious folks probably heard this parable and they said, the kingdom of God is experienced in my everyday life. The power of God is absorbed and unleashed as we go along. Just having enough bread or meeting the basic needs of our friends can transform their lives. Bread has power. Yeast is not only invisible, it's not only increasing, it's not only intentional, but yeast is irreversible. Once you had a taste of the kingdom, you'll never go back. And then there was this group called the common seers. The come and see is by this time are probably excited. Other folks are a little bit more emotive, if you will. Amen? They probably got a little bit closer to Jesus. They would have understood and begin to realize the impact and the influence of the yeast. They recognize that when carbon monoxide is given off, there is an energy created. Are you with me? The Bible says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The come and see has probably understood something about energy and power. They probably recognize that there are two kinds of power, at least if not four. They would understand that Jesus would talk when he said, power, let your kingdom come, the power and the glory. He understood power was either dunamis or exousia. Are you still with me? Greek words, but I'm about to explain. Amen. The dunamis is connected to like dynamite, right? It's power unloaded and exploded. It's ability, it's strength. It's, 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 it's just you stand in your place and it is what it is, amen? And then there's exousia, which is authority to use the power that you have. Are you with me? So when he said the power of the kingdom of God, the come and see us would have heard, not only am I made in the image of God, filled with the spirit of God, equipped for the things of God, and created for good works, but I am authorized to use use the power in the places in which I am. Are you with me? And so they got excited, the power of the kingdom. I'm not a trespasser on the enemy's territory. This here belongs to God, the power of the kingdom. And so maybe they heard the dunamis or the exousia, the power of God, or maybe they were just scientists, if you will. They understood the difference between kinetic energy and power and potential energy and power. See, we all have energy in our bodies that store when we are not in motion. You have energy and power even when you're just sitting still. Amen? 
But something totally different happens when you release your potential power and it turns into kinetic energy. It's like when you put something in motion, you release the power and the work that's needed to accelerate and make a change. Are you with me? And so when they heard the kingdom power, they were called to let loose, let go and release the very gifts and the very callings of God. It's like that great Nike commercial. When Jesus says the power come, he said, just do it. That's the power of God. If you step out, God will be there. And then there was the last thing. If I was at my home church, I'd say, and then I'm going to take my seat. Amen? The last group are the committed people who heard the parable of the kingdom of God. This last group had heard it all. They understood the dynamics of power sources. They understood that yeast is invisible, it's intentional, it's irreversible. And then this last thing, they understood that yeast is irresistible. In his best-selling book, The Tipping Point, the author Malcolm Gladwell agrees. He says that there are great movements and amazing developments in history and industry that seem to occur in a particular given moment and according to a certain pattern. He suggests that if you have just a few people committed to a compelling vision like the kingdom in a certain context like an urban setting there is a potential energy for a seemingly random set of moments to collide in such a way as to produce a threshold that will change life forever stay with me that is there's a certain moment when the environment is just right when all that you hope for and plan for and pray for and dreamed about suddenly collide in such a way that it comes to pass some people in the Old Testament call it your season. Others in the New Testament call it your kairos moment. And most of us just call it the kingdom. The kingdom is best understood in its power like this. There was a game when I was growing up. Uh, it's called Don't Spill the Beans. It's kind of an old school game. It costs about $4 at the Kmart. Amen? And so the way that Don't Spill the Beans worked is each person got a few beans, right? And there was a big kettle like this. You had to put a little bean on the kettle. The object was not to have the beans tip over. And so you put one and your friend put one and you put one. Inevitably, somebody will put the bean on the little kettle and the whole thing will tumble over and splatter all on the floor. That's what Malcolm Gladwell talks about when he talks about the tipping point. And that's what Jesus talks about when the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. That when you least expect it, one thing that you have said, preached, prayed, done, a phone call, a word of encouragement that you have done in somebody's life will tip them over, transform their life, and they will experience the very power, the very healing, and the very kingdom of God. Could it be, friends, that we have been strategically placed in this place these three days because God is orchestrating a massive movement in the kingdom where we're about to receive a rush of the power of God. Here's the record. We got the people. Amen? We have a compelling vision to minister to youth. We have a context, a community expanded, and we have a hope that change will come. When the kingdom of God is realized as yeast, defeat turns to destiny, Theory turns to reality, temptation turns to testimony, mockery turns to victory, the obscurity turns to notoriety, and the kingdom of God comes with power. Quick testimony, I'm going to take my seat for real. Um, when I started out as a youth pastor about, oh, 12 years ago, I ain't know nothing about youth ministry, amen? You just kind of volunteer you in. I'm a youth pastor. They say, here the building, here the kids, don't break nothing, amen? That was my introduction to youth ministry. I was in the city, amen. I was kind of a little bit scared myself to go to my car after youth group, but I did my little thing, and we just going to raise up the children. We're going to have youth group. I did that for a couple years. And then I got called to another church, and it wasn't hardly no better. We just had more kids, a few more dollars, but it's still me, the key, and the children, amen, at the church. That's what it was, youth ministry. Well, we built this little ministry called Height from the ground up. You know, it was kind of beautiful, it was kind of fun. And we were going to the schools. I didn't know no better. I didn't know the rules. You couldn't go in schools. So I just went to the schools, right? Ate lunch with the children. I did Bible study about in the church. And the little ministry grew. It was real nice. It was a little hard sometimes because the kids want to cuss in the church, you know, put toilet paper, toilet in the toilet paper, all kind of stuff. But we kept on going. And so we did this little ministry about five years. It was kind of hard. Went up here. People were like, why you got them bad kids in the church? Because our ministry was aimed not at the deacon's kids or the pastor's kids 
but our ministry was aimed at the under-challenged and the unchurched. These kids did never go to church. Their parents didn't go to church. Their kids didn't care that they came to church. So it was us and the children. Amen. So for five years, I'm just working, working, working for Jesus. You know, I'm not tired yet. Amen. I'm believing that God going to work it out. And so I work with my little babies. Amen. I go away for five years. I'm still working. I'm working with college students. I'm so excited. God moving by power. I felt a little bad. I'm going to confess my sin. I felt a little bit bad that I had left my junior hires and my high school kids go to college kids. But then my friend prophesied into my life. And she said, well, no, at least you're just growing up with the generation. Amen. And so I'm ushered in this generation. Here's a funny story. The kids in my fifth grade youth group. Some seeds that I didn't even know plant. It wasn't me, it was God nurturing this thing. Because you know, the kingdom is like yeast, it's invisible. You all know it's at work, all right? They graduated now from the college, and they did just like John Perkins said. They came back and found me. And they said, Reverend, what can I do to serve the kingdom? I've gone to my college and had Bible studies and had rallies. The kingdom of God is coming with power. You don't know the seeds you planted, but I guarantee you're going to have a harvest with power. There's still one more thing. Just in Central America, between 200 and 300,000 young people involved in the MS-13 or the Salvatrucha gang. If you read the magazine, World Magazine of June 2005, they stated the Salvatruchas have become the second largest domestic threat to the USA. These are kids that are killing kids. These are kids that are killing pregnant women. It doesn't matter. The one of the worst cartels in Latin America today is the cartel in Ciudad Juarez. About eight months ago, they lost $30 million worth of cocaine. They thought it was the DA. They thought it was the police. No, 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old kids went into the place, killed 30 of their men, and stole $30 million worth of cocaine. Last year, we had five attacks to prisons in Central America. Five key prisons, 45 key leaders from other gangs were assassinated and they checked the cell phone calls all traced to Los Angeles, California. About three years ago, we requested a meeting with three of these key gang leaders. We wanted to talk to them. Listen, we wanted to hear the voice from the street. Because the last time we looked at this parable just a minute ago, it has one very interesting characteristic. It works from the inside to the outside. And last time I heard, I read Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Follow me if you have your Bible zero. Just listen to it. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was over the waters. Wait a second. It doesn't say it was clean. It was nice. The pews were in order. The carpet was clean. The walls were clean. No graffiti. No. It was in the middle of disorder. It was in the middle of darkness that the Spirit of God was. <sighs> Took us six months for them to accept our request to meet with them. They met us in Central Park in a city in, what, in, uh, in Latin America. They put caps over our heads and they drove us for about 45 minutes and they took us to a cave. I didn't even know we had caves in that city. And in the middle of this dark cave, only with candles, they took the caps off our heads. And there were 13, 14, 15 year old kids with AK-47s and three men sitting, waiting for us to come and talk to them. Three men around 40 some years old. Talking about the need for models. Talking about the need for role models. And in our middle of, in the middle of our conversation, one of the guys that was with me decided to ask the key leader a question about how can a young man leave the Salvatrucha gang? And you've probably heard this. His answer was first, death, 
And second, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. I'm quoting the guy. Accept Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. I know it's going to sound weird what I'm going to say. Right there, in the middle of that cave, in the darkness, among the guns and the killers, the Spirit of God was... Because the power of the kingdom works from the inside to the outside. Wait a second, why are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that actually God walks in my streets? Are you actually suggesting that God walks right there with the homeless? Are you actually? No, I'm not suggesting anything. Come on, I'm just a stinking Latino. <laughs> I'm just going back to scripture. And last time I read scripture, Jesus, the power now was walking where you walk with the kids that you work. Is it possible that God really works in the midst of prostitutes and homeless kids in Guatemala City? Yes, you will have to come and visit this ministry called When the Church Sleeps. Because it's literally happening Well, the structural, institutional bureaucracy that we call the church is sleeping. The church is in the street where the Spirit of God is Hovering. What do we do with this? One of the ugliest stories that we find in Scripture that we were talking about in a consultation in Guatemala a couple of weeks ago, where we invited key gang leaders to come and talk to the church. We invited 70 key leaders to come to our office in Guatemala, Central America. And if you've never been to Guatemala, you have to go to Guatemala. If you want to be in the center of God's will, you have to go to Guatemala at some point in your life. There's an opening in my office. If you're interested, you can come and talk to me later. We invited 70 key leaders to come from Central America, and we invited key leaders that are actually active in the gang to come and talk to us because we wanted to hear from the street. We wanted to hear the voices from the street, and these key gang leaders told us some amazing things about what God is doing in the midst of darkness. They might not recognize it, because that's why you're there so that you can come and break it down in a listening mode i was telling you about that ugly story it's in it's in judges 19 about this concubine that gets cut in 12 pieces and it's sent to the 12 tribes this is not a story we hear every sunday isn't it okay today we're going to talk about this concubine that was cut in 12 pieces no, because it's an ugly story. And yet, toward the end of the story, we find something very practical for our ministries as we see the kingdom now. And I want to read to you that last part of that verse. If you have your Bibles, we'll close reading and asking ourselves a couple questions. Judges 19.30 says, Everyone who saw it, everybody that saw these pieces spread all over the place, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day of the Israelites came out of Egypt. Listen to these three principles. Think about it, consider it, and then tell us what to do. Right there where you are, the kingdom is present. Because the kingdom, like we heard, all these characteristics is there. It's going to be working from the inside out. And yet our responsibility is to... Listen, let's just stop talking. For Latinos, that's hard. <laughs> this is the North American clock, and this is the Latino clock. <laughs> I want to keep on going for another 40. This is saying one minute left. Because my nature is to talk. I like to talk. And all of us, the Christians, we love to talk because we have the answer. Well, now it's time for us. To listen, yes. to take counsel, 
to consider. And then God will show you how you need to live out that power that is already there in your neighborhood because you're there. My last name is Jeffrey de Leon. Leon in Spanish is lion. And when they invited me to come and share with Elise and with you guys, I literally feel like a lion in the Daniel's den. Because you are the Daniels. You are the Daniels in the trenches. You don't have anything to fear. The title in my Bible reads, Daniel in the lion's den. It's wrong. It should say, the poor lions in the Daniel's den. <laughs> because when you're there, the power of the kingdom is there. And even though you might not see it today or tomorrow, now is the kingdom. God bless you, and let's live the kingdom. <laughs>